Okay. Back at it again. Today's a different day. I'm not, not fertilizing today. Well, per se, I am, but I'm spraying liquid today instead of dropping granular fertilizer on the ground, which is a bit different. So today I'm going to be about 10 foot off the crop. Um, going a little faster because uh, the plane's a little slipperier with, uh, with the spray system versus the fertilizer spreader. And I'm spraying fungicide uh, on beans. Beans are cool because uh, the leaves are real, real light and when you fly over them it turns all the leaves and you can see all your passes in the beans. It's, uh, it's Well, I think it's cool, but most of y'all probably won't care about that at all. Anyway, I'm playing this field right here. I've got a couple fields to spray and there's a bunch of trees in the mix. I've got about a 10 mile an hour south wind, which is uh, always fun when there's trees around. So I'm doing all these beans over here to the left. I'm doing this one right here. I'm just uh, I'm going to survey the field. Uh, it's important when you fertilize. It's extra important when you spray because you're in harm's way. Basically, you're down amongst things to hit when you're spraying. So it looks like we got some logging guys right here, and that's right on the edge of my field. That kind of sucks. The wind's blowing away from them, so that's good. So. Uh, it's against the laws of physics for my spray to move upwind, so that means that these guys will not get sprayed. And if they say the dude, they're lying. But uh, those guys are probably cool. I bet they're not going to care that I'm here. So anyway, uh, I'm going to start right here on this edge of the field. Just uh, I'm going to circle back around these logging guys again, make sure that they see me. I don't want to fly over the top and scare the crap out of them. Uh, I will be going towards them on that side of the field uh, because that's how my racetrack pattern is going to be set up. So anyway, everything looks good. Uh, the fungicide, there's really nothing to hurt. I don't really need to worry about adjacent crops or anything like that. I just I need to worry about houses. I need to worry about people like that. Those guys down there in the uh, doing that logging looks like they're clearing all those trees out, which is good. Well, I guess it depends on how you feel, but. In farmland, uh, it's better for me anyway, let's just put it that way, because uh, trees are big and hard and they break airplanes when you hit them, so. I'm going to zoom on in, I'm going to get started, I'm going to do a racetrack pattern just like, uh, just like I did previously. Uh, on the last video that I talked in, I've got a pretty similar load today, so I've got uh, 700 gallons of water, chemical, and liquid fertilizer. The liquid fertilizer weighs 11 pounds a gallon. I've got 250 gallons of that. Uh, basically, what that equals uh, with my fuel and chemical and everything, I've got about an 8,500 pound load. And that's a payload, that's not gross weight. The gross weight of this plane right now is about 16,000 pounds. So what that means is I need to be real easy with the stick, uh, especially when I'm pulling up over stuff in my turns, uh, it's very easy to get into an accelerated stall in this plane when it's at a high, gro you know, heavy weight. Uh, the gross weight of the plane is 16.5, like the maximum gross weight. So I'm under that, but I'm pretty darn close to it. So we're flying about as heavy as you can fly a plane, uh, one of these planes anyways. There's the logging guy. He's going to pop some smoke right here so that they know that it's blowing away from them. So the, the accelerated stall is uh, a real thing. I got an argument once with an airline captain who had 18,000 hours. And I do that because hands and feet on the controls of the plane are what I call hours. When you're sitting uh, flying in a straight line under autopilot, I think that should count for not a full hour. Anyway, uh, and he was under the full belief that you could not stall an airplane below its stall speed. And really, a stall speed is, is relative to your angle of attack. You can stall a plane at 50, you can stall a plane at 150, because the speed is not what causes the stall, of course. It's exceeding the critical angle of attack is what causes the stall. Well, this 18,000 hour pilot didn't know that. And uh, anyway, it's a very, uh, it's a very big problem in this industry, especially when you're heavy, especially when you're in a downwind pass and you're making a big hard pull up over trees uh, with the wind at your back. That's a, all, that's a combination for dying and nobody wants to die. So I'm paying a lot of attention to that. Um, believe it or not, I'm not really looking at the trees that much. Um, 
it's kind of the same principle as riding a motorcycle. Like if, if a deer runs out in the road and you stare at the deer, you're probably going to hit the deer. So if I stared at the tops of these trees, the likelihood of me hitting them is a lot. So I look above the top of the trees, which is where I'd like to go. And uh, make nice, easy pulls on the stick. You don't want to stick jockey these planes really ever. You especially don't want to uh, tell them what to do when you're heavy. you got to ask the plane what to do and be ready for it to say no, have a plan B. And uh, plan B in this case um, would be my flaps. So I've got flaps, uh, they're on a rocker switch on my stick right here. Uh, my pointer finger works, I'm just kind of like the, the guns in a fighter plane. And if, if I'm easing up over these trees and I feel a, a small buffet uh, from you know a stall, I'll, I'll get a little flaps. And I don't care how fast I'm going either because I'd rather do that uh, than run into those trees. I don't get a lot of flaps, just a little bit, just a little bump, you know, will uh, will go a long way. And uh, all in the name of, of not crashing and not dying. So the basic rule when it comes to diving over trees is, uh, and this is my rule, I don't know how everybody else flies, but uh, I do not push over the trees and pull any negative G's. Uh, that's a kind of a no-no for me, uh, mainly because I usually have an open cup of coffee in here, and today is a little bumpy, so I've got a little Yeti cup, but it's still got a little hole in the top of the lid, and I do not want to spill my coffee, okay? I also don't want all the stuff that I've got sitting in here, like my pins and my clipboard and all the stuff in my little, like the little box that I'm talking to you through. If you pull negative G's, all that stuff is going to leave where it's sitting and float in the air. And then when you round out your dive, it'll all slam back down onto the ground, usually not in the place that it was before uh, you did that. And that's not good. Uh, you don't want stuff getting up under your rudder pedals or anything like that. Or, you know, uh, you, just don't want, you just don't want to avoid that. So I don't pull negative G's. I basically, I put it into a, a zero, or not a zero, one G dive. Um, so I'm not pulling positive, I'm not pulling negative. I'm just basically going at an angle straight down and then I round it out at the bottom. And that rounding out's another situation where you can get in trouble, especially if you're, uh, you're going downwind. Uh, with this big heavy plane, if you get in a steep dive and you are too aggressive pulling it out, you will uh, buff it and you could possibly stall the airplane. And another thing you could do, which, and I've actually done this before a long time ago, uh, you can, the plane will mush, which means like your nose will go up, but the plane's going to continue to sink like that, uh, and you'll get into the crop. And I've, uh, I've got into some corn pretty good doing that uh, several years ago in a 502, and it scared me pretty good. Um, I was lucky I didn't crash the plane, because the corn is, corn doesn't play. Like, it, it looks nice and soft from the air, but it, it'll ruin your plane, uh, and you, if you let it. I've known several people that have got their wingtip uh, in, in the corn uh, when they were landing. You know, the corn was beside the runway. And uh, it's, it's broke. It's ripped wingtips off. It'll pull the whole plane into the crop. I mean, it'll total a plane. It's just, uh, it's not good. So I learned a hard lesson that day. Uh, but anyway, so my spray system is uh, much like my fertilizer system. Uh, it's computer controlled. I've got a spray handle. I don't actually have a switch. I've got a handle that I, and I open a ball valve with it. And uh, I've got an air driven pump on the front of the plane. It's got a magnetic brake on so I can shut it off if I need to. Uh, the pump recirculates the chemical when I'm not spraying. So right now it's all recirculating in my hopper, staying good and mixed up. And I've got a computer that uh, monitors the volume. So I basically tell it what volume. So what I'm doing now is I'm doing 200 acre loads and I'm taking 700 gallons. So that's uh, three and a half gallons per acre is what I'm spraying. So I type that into the computer and the computer monitors my ground speed and it's got its own ball valve down there that's got an electric motor on it and it opens it up and closes it to hold uh, my volume uh, consistent or steady or whatever. Um, it's about a lot like my fertilizer gate. And you can actually see that in this red box over here. The top number is my boom pressure. The bottom number is the gallons of my hopper. So this is an upwind pass. My boom pressure was about 50, which is a little bit high. It's not too high. I like to keep it at 40. Uh, this next pass is a downwind pass. And now watch what happens with my boom pressure. I'll be going across the ground quite a bit faster. 
my boom pressure is going to be quite a bit higher on this pass. And that's, uh, that's what that computer does. Before the computers, we'd have to open the, basically, uh, the stop on our handle and open, open our spray valve a little bit more to get more pressure so we'd uh, put the spray out at the appropriate volume. So I'm at 55 on this pass. I pulled the power back a little bit. We'll have to check that again. I bet you uh, 55 on this pass. I bet you my next pass is probably going to be around 45. We'll just keep the power where it's at. I'm at uh, 1550 on the prop, uh, 2760 on the torque. I don't know how many horsepower that is. It's probably 750. Uh, torque times RPM divided by 5252 uh, equals horsepower. All right, so it was 55 on that last pass, and I got to watch out for these trees. It's only 20 right now. I was going pretty darn slow. I got to go around because I uh, I was in not in the right situation to hop over those trees. I was going a little bit slow, and when I got right when I got down in the field, I would have needed to pull up and then push over the trees. And like I said before, I don't like to pull negative G's, so we're just going to make a big circle. And I'm going to dive in on the other side of those trees. You don't want to hit a tree. I've hit trees before. It's not fun. My first season I hit a tree. Doing exactly what I was talking about earlier. I was on a heavy, hot, downwind pass. And when I pulled up, the plane started to buff it. So naturally, you cannot pull up anymore. When that starts to happen, you just have to ride it out. And I rode it out all the way through the top of the tree. And it destroyed the leading edge of that wing. It was the right-hand wing. It just bashed it in. I mean, it looked like you shot it with a bunch of golf balls and through a Gatlin gun. It was terrible. Yeah, I got lucky on that one. If I was a couple feet lower, it might have it might have broke the wing off. It might have thrown me into a, a spin. Uh, I mean, there's no telling. I got really lucky. That was within the first uh, 100 hours of me flying one of these. And I got into my first spray plane, I had about 300 hours total time. Like it was, uh, I was pretty darn fresh. And uh, I've been doing nothing but this ever since. Uh, I've got about 7,000 hours now. I've had a couple of people planes. And I had a Mooney M20 um, and all that stuff. So I've done a little bit of other flying, but pretty much this is it. I'm pretty much a stick and rudder only guy. And uh, about 90% of that 7,000 hours is tailwheel time, too. It's just basically it's just doing this. This is a goal of mine when I first, uh, before I even got my pilot's license. I basically I took a summer job. I was in college. I took a summer job. I don't even think I'm going to get to spray on this pass. I'm, there's going to be a couple passes where I'm going to be over these trees until I move over to that side of the field. So I think what I'm going to do is a couple back-to-back -back passes over here, and uh, it'll get me, I won't have to deadhead like this again. Um, but anyway, I took a summer job in college uh, loading chemicals. It was just something to do in the summertime. I liked airplanes, you know, I flew remote control airplanes growing up. Um, I built them, flew them, all that stuff. Uh, I played the heck out of some flight simulator when I was a kid. Just, I just always really liked airplanes. I took that summer job mixing the chemicals and pretty, whoa, the wind about rolled me over right there. Uh, pretty quickly figured out that this is what I needed to be doing with my life. So um, I was pretty focused on this and only this. And that's why I got in one at 300 hours. I mean, that's all I ever wanted to do. And so I just made sure to take all the necessary steps to make it happen. And uh, with uh, a lot of hard work and a little bit of luck, uh, it happened. So anyway, I'm going to do a back-to-back -back pass right here, and then I'll do one more on this side of the field, and I should uh, be on the other side of those trees by that time. So my laser altimeter, when I'm spraying, uh, I like to keep it around 10 feet. Uh, if, you, if you watched my last video on the fertilizer, you'll notice I'm quite a bit lower uh, spraying, and that's because if you if you fly really high with this stuff, I mean it'll just vaporize or blow off somewhere else before it gets down to the field. It's not uh, not the same as the the dry granular uh, granular fertilizer. Pretty well falls straight down, so you can be a little bit higher. Also, we need to be higher for the pattern to develop better. Uh, this stuff you need to be about 12 feet. And that's all you need to be. So there's my laser altimeter. It's reading nine feet, eight feet, nine feet, ten feet.
It's sensitive just like my, uh, my cross track is sensitive. Um, you can't see the light bar up there, but the cross track basically that tells me how far I am to the left or right of my line. It's super sensitive. I mean, it updates like 20 times a second, so it's pretty real time. I'll try to read it out to you on this next pass. Uh, it's windy enough that I'm not going to keep it dead center the whole pass, so it, and you might be able to see how sensitive it is. Let's see here. See, I'm 27, 28, 26, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, there's 10 foot, 9 foot, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 0, right 1, 0, 0, left 2, left 1, 0, right 2, right 2, right 3, right 2, right 1, 0. Okay, i got to stop looking at it now. It was pretty much dead zero for the last part of that little pass. All right, so I've done several passes over here. The whole time I was clicking through my passes on the other end of my pattern, but they were all over those trees, so there's no point in turning around and just flying over those trees for no reason, so... Now, let's see if, uh, if it's moved over far enough where I can spray a pass in this field right here. And it has. Well, it's pretty close. It looks like if I stayed on my line, my left wing would be in those trees, so I'm just going to move over a little bit. Uh, the wind's blowing towards those trees anyways a little bit. I'm just going to stay a little bit high. I'm going to let the wind blow it over there. Just make sure I got the edge of that field. Whoop, got to miss that tree. All right, there's that logging crew down there again. Can't forget about those guys. That guy on that little logger picker upper, man, if he's not paying attention, I fly right over the top of him. They could scare him half to death. And if he had a heart attack in there, I could probably get sued. So I'm going to stay away from those guys. Not worried about spraying them because the wind's blowing away from them at about 10 to 12 miles an hour. today it's not bad um, but it's definitely a lot harder to stay on your line and, and turn around and all that stuff when the winds blowing like this and this particular chemical it's it's fungicide so we're, I'm not real concerned uh, there is a legal wind limit it's on the label of the chemical and I think it's about 15 miles an hour for this chemical I don't mean I don't think it I know it's 15 for this so Fungicide usually has a higher wind limit than a uh, herbicide does. And I mean, even if a herbicide, some of it does have a, a limit of 15, but you're not going to find me out here spraying herbicide in 15. That's just uh, irresponsible. Got to pull up a little center, so my left wing, and that's enough there. That's a Ford Raptor down there. Would you look at that? Looks like this corn below me is not in that great a shape. It's probably not irrigated. Might not have got enough water. It doesn't look that good. It's real short too. So anyway, uh, you know, besides uh, staying on the line, keeping my laser altimeter, and making sure I don't run into stuff, uh, I'm going to constantly check to make sure that my my flow control, the computer that controls my spray volume, I'm going to constantly check to make sure that it's working. Because if it stops working and I don't catch that, that could be a problem. You know, what, what could happen is it could be putting out way too much chemical, in which case I wouldn't have enough to finish the job, in which case uh, we'd have to buy more chemical uh, to finish the job. And this stuff's probably 30 to $40 an acre. This job is uh, 2,300 acres, and that's a lot of freaking money. So uh, I need to pay attention to all that to make sure that uh, that doesn't happen. And, um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, I'm, I'm checking to make sure the situation around the field doesn't change. I'm watching for cars and trucks to come down this gravel road here at the south end. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of paying attention to the wind, what it's doing. Because if it starts picking up anymore, I'm going to have to shut down. Watching these guys here, making sure they don't uh, try to get brave and get a cool picture, which happens a lot, believe it or not. Um, you know, I've had kids run out in the field before that I was spraying to get a cool picture. Uh, you got to pay attention to all that. If you spray somebody's kid, it's not going to be a good day for you. My, uh, my first season, I had a guy chasing me around on a riding lawnmower. He was going, I don't even know where he come from because I was out in the middle of Tennessee. 
Uh, there wasn't even a house within a couple miles, so I don't know how far this guy drove this mower. But anyway, like, <laughs> I was playing a field and I see this guy park his riding lawnmower right on the road downwind of what I was spraying. And so I couldn't spray because this guy's there. He didn't have a shirt on or anything. And like, he's just standing there. I, and I was like, what is this guy doing? So I went to a different field that was kind of close by. It was a half mile away or so. And lo and behold, about 20 minutes later, here comes this riding lawnmower pulling up to my field. Downwind again. That was my first season. Luckily, I had enough sense to stop spraying because I was spraying bug juice that time, and bug killer is not that good for you. Well, I'm sure most of this stuff isn't good for you, but uh, bug juice especially, if it gets on your skin, it'll kind of burn. Like, it's just not, it's not pleasant. And this guy didn't even have a shirt on. Here's that crew again. I'm going to blow some smoke so that they can see exactly where this stuff I'm spraying is going. Like just some courtesy smoke there. Hopefully they can put two and two together watching that smoke blow away from them. They'll realize that they're not getting sprayed. So turning the plane around in this wind is, uh, it's not super difficult. You just have to pay more attention to what you're doing. You know, when you're turning downwind, I mean, you can't be jockeying this thing around. Um, and then you also have to pay enough attention, you need to get far enough away from your field that the wind doesn't blow you so close to your field you can't make any corrections to get on your line uh, because you're so close to it. Oh, it's a tall tree. Oh, hey. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's, it's just flying an airplane, you know. Airplanes aren't that complicated to fly, really. It's, it's, I mean, at this point in time, it's more of a feel anyway. You know, if I flew this thing like uh, one weekend a month, it'd be a different story, but uh, I fly it a lot. This particular aircraft, um, I got in this plane at the end of 2019. It had 800 hours on the hops meter. And by the way, this hops meter only runs when I'm about above half throttle. So no taxi time gets counted. Uh, when I pull the throttle back to land, it stops counting. So anyway, I got in it at the end of 2019, had 800 even on it. Now, right now it's got 2990. So I put 21, almost 2200 hours on it uh, since the end of 2019. Plenty of time, so uh, needless to say, I'm good and comfortable in this airplane. I like this airplane. It's a 2018 model uh, 802A, I think. Uh, it's got a Pratt & Whitney Dash 65 on it. I had a comment on my last channel, they were like, 93 gallons an hour. They were surprised. Well, it is, I mean, this is a big motor. The shaft horsepower rating on this motor is 1,300. You know, 4,000 foot-pounds of torque. It's good. It takes a bit of fuel to make that much power. This actually um, is pretty similar to the motor that's on a Pilatus. There's, there are several differences, but uh, it's in the same family anyway. I'm getting pretty close to being done with this. I'll have some trimming to do. I need to make a trim pass along the south edge of the field because I've got a good south wind and I'm not able to carry my spray out over the edge because of these trees and that loading crew. So I'll need to do that. Probably need to make some trim up passes around these trees because I can't get down on the crop real good um, right up next to the trees. The wind's gonna help with that a little bit. The wind will blow the tree, the, the chemical up into the trees if the trees are downwind. Not all these trees are downwind is the problem. You can see in the beans the wind is blowing the bean leaves. That's not, the be beans are, have, I guess they have light leaves, I don't know, they blow at five mile an hour wind. The corn, however, won't. And when the corn starts moving around, that's when you need to really consider uh, stopping because uh, it takes about a 15 mile an hour wind to move that corn around. It also takes about a 15 mile an hour wind to make a little white cap, like in a lake or a pond. So if you've got a little body of water around and you see little white caps in it, uh, you know the wind's at least 15 miles an hour. And it's time to stop spraying.
you can fertilize in whatever you want to. For like fertilizer is, it's, it's, it's like cat litter, pretty much, consistency. Maybe and a lot of it's a little bit bigger than that. Um, it's just going to fall down. It's not going to hurt anything either. It'll just fall down. It'll be okay. Uh, spraying, not so much. You know, when you're putting out a volume like three gallons to the acre, if you think about it, that's really not a lot. It's not like a, a flood coming out of the back of this plane. It's, it's pretty fine droplets. And uh, if it's windy, it's, you know, the wind's going to move those small droplets quite a bit. And so to make a good, accurate app application and not waste anybody's money, um, it's, it's better to not spray when it's 15 or above. Not to mention, it's pretty much illegal. So there's that. Some 59 pounds of pressure on this downwind run. I'm not going to touch the power. I'm at 2880 on the torque right now. I'm going to go over here. Ugh. Let's see what my let's see what my boom pressure is going upwind. I didn't look at my ground speed. It's probably around 180. Gonna guess. Ooh, it's bumpy right here. All right, my boom pressure on this pass is 40, 39, 40. So that's a pretty big difference. That's about a 20 psi difference, and, and it takes that much of a difference to put out the same volume upwind versus downwind. Now what I got to do is uh, I got to run over here and spray this little nook that was it was in between two sets of trees, and not enough for me to get down and back up. Uh, Efficiently, I could have done it with the airplane, but the, I would have been so high in the air with that spray on that the spray would have just blown off somewhere else. So I'm gonna go do this the long way. I'm gonna do a back-to-back -back pattern on this, which is basically like you mow your yard. And I'm gonna start on the upwind side, so the uh, the wind is blowing the chemical away from my next pass, and also allows me to turn into the wind on every turn. So that's set up on a left back to back. I need a right back to back. Let's press this little button right here. Press it again. All right. So these turns are gonna be a little bit more uh, quote unquote extreme. They're not extreme by any means, but um, my last ones are pretty laid back and easy. You know, I had a pretty wide, you know, my, my lines were probably 1400 feet from each other uh, on this particular pattern so I'm just doing pass after pass after pass my passes are like you know 75 feet from each other so I have to go way out here this is my downwind turn right here that was full this is also full aileron by the way it's as fast as this plane rolls and I got uh, 1315 feet away from my line so that's actually a little further than I need to be uh, considering this wind I could have I could have turned a little closer Anyway, back here on pass number three. And I'll pop some smoke on this pass so you can kind of see when I turn around. You can kind of see what the wind is doing. And you'll see how far away the chemical and the smoke is from me uh, on my next pass. I'll get this set up so that the wind blows it away from me because I don't want to fly through it. I don't know if it causes cancer. RFK says it does. He's a pretty smart guy. So I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna flirt with disaster here. The smoke's way over there, so is my chemical. That's good, that's what I want. Ooh, a tall tree, okay, hey. And full aileron again, that's full left aileron right there. It's as fast as this thing rolls. Flaps down to two thirds. Not a lot going on in this turn. I mean, I could pretty much take my whoop, hand off the stick. I did need just a slight amount of back pressure on the stick. The uh, the flaps really pull the nose around, really a lot, they, a lot, a lot. Like if you put, if you're going 130 miles an hour, and you start putting your flaps down, this thing will pitch straight up in the air. 
It's actually kind of scary. And one more. I think I got one more pass here. I'm getting about 500 foot in these turns. These aren't crazy turns. I got several more passes here, so my uh, my shape file ends right there. But I know that you know all these beans need to be sprayed, so I'm gonna keep going here. The shape file is basically the file on my computer that's got the outline of the field. They're not always 100% accurate, and in this case, they're not. And now that I'm thinking about it, I, sp I spray this field a couple times a year, so it's always this way. I need to mention that. There's also a part of the trees over there that are included in the shape file, so the acres are always right. But uh, we should probably just fix that just because. All right. This will be a little more of an uh, aggressive turn. So I got 500 feet away from my next line. I might overshoot it by 100 feet or so because 500 feet is pretty aggressive. Overshot about 86 feet, and it's full left alien on there. Pull it out of the turn. So I got in a little bit of a situation where my aileron kind of stalled. And that's what you get for for not flying easy and smooth. You know, they said in Days of Thunder that, uh, what is it, uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And kind of the same principle applies to flying these things. Like, if you're in here throwing this stick around hard, uh, it's going to bite you in the ass. There's no point. No point in doing that. You're not going to gain any time. You're not going to get any more loads done than the other guy by brashing this thing around. All you're going to do is put yourself in a situation to get hurt and do a bad job for the farmer. You know, first and foremost, our, our duty to the farmer is to make this application as accurate as possible. Uh, like I said before, this stuff is really expensive, and when these guys are spending 30, 40 bucks an acre plus the fly-in, which is about eight dollars an acre, uh, that's a lot of money. And I know that if somebody was out here doing that bad of a job with my money, I'd be really mad about it. So it's it's important that we do everything that we can do to make the best application possible. And uh, most of us are very responsible like that, and we we really do care about our application. And, you know, it's like my name is all over these jobs that I do. And uh, I don't want a, a bad reputation. And speaking of being responsible, uh, if any of you guys saw that video circulate around of that guy flying across the interstate right in front of the semi-truck, that guy's a moron. And when you do stuff like that, you will not have a very long career in this industry. So nobody thinks that's cool, except uh, morons, except fellow morons. All right, well, I'm done with this field. Actually, I'm not. I need to make one more trim pass. One more trim pass along those trees, and then I'll be done with this field. These are not my favorite fields, by the way. Um, I had a like a mile and a half, two mile long field I did earlier, uh, but those are boring to watch. Nobody wants to watch that. It's just like I dive in the field and I just spray for days, and then I make a turn and then I turn around and then I spray for days. Like this field is more interesting. It's got trees. They had a crew down here working on something. 